Welcome back. We've been discussing Lebanon. In the last uh, segment, if you recall, we discussed the very brief civil war in Lebanon. Uh, and then we mentioned that after that civil war, there was a relatively long period of prosperity covering a period from 1958 until 1975. Uh, during that segment, I also mentioned that in the first civil war, Palestinians were not a factor. However, uh, for the great civil war from 1975 until 1990, Palestinians were a big factor. Now, continuing on the theme regarding the Palestinian, um, uh, I pointed out that uh, up to that point, uh, their sense of efficacy had uh, diminished quite a bit. But uh, as the end, at the end of that civil war, and especially in the 1960s, early 60s, as the political awareness of the Palestinian began to grow, and they began to think of alternatives to compel the international community especially the United States, to allow them to have dignity and self-determination, they began to look to these other ways of uh, making the international community recognize them. Now, if you can't achieve this through kindness, uh, you are likely to choose the route of violence. So they took a page from the Zionist playbook, and they decided to pretty much follow their plan the way they were able to establish the state of Israel and also remember that they used terror against the British to ensure that they will uh, pretty much get what they were demanding. So the first thing they learned was that they had to organize themselves and they just cannot entirely rely on the Arabs. They have to make some moves themselves. Now the question is, where do you do that? The most logical place would be Jordan. Jordan is abutting Israel, and it's uh, a good part of it. The West Bank would be uh, part of the Palestinian state. So Jordan was now a majority Palestinian after all, so that made a lot of sense. Now, during the mid to late 1960s, uh, Palestinians, as their political awareness is growing, are becoming increasingly assertive and uh, dominant in the politics of Jordan. Also, I should mention, uh, as they start asserting themselves and conducting raids against Israel, uh, for Palestinian small defeats uh, against an all-powerful enemy as Israel was actually a morale booster. So, so long as they could pretty much put up a good fight, that would enhance their morale. Now, King Hussein of Jordan was now being repeatedly humiliated by the actions of his Palestinian subjects, who really didn't have much respect for him. When the Palestinian uh, group hijacked three aircrafts and wouldn't let the Jordanian authorities near the planes, that really did it for the king. He would now go after the Palestinians. And the Palestinians were going to get smashed. And sure enough, that happened in September 1970, which became known, if you recall from previous lectures, as the Black September. Also, during this period, Nasser of Egypt was alive uh, he would die shortly, but Nasser basically supported Hussein in his crackdown of Palestinian. Uh, the logic here was, as far as Nasser was concerned, was the fear that the Palestinian, by their activities and by challenging King Hussein, they were taking the Arabs into a premature war uh, with Israel the outcome of which would have been simply disastrous for the Arabs. However, in Syria, President Jadid uh, was of a different uh, outlook. He believed that he should help the Palestinian, even if that meant uh, the defeat of uh, King Hussein. So he desperately tried to help them out. 
And he did this by sending some of his army tanks in support of the Palestinian from Syria into Jordan. And now <clears throat> what you have is suddenly uh, Kissinger also enters the picture. Uh, Kissinger was a national security advisor to President Nixon. And to understand Kissinger's involvement, you have to understand that he was an extreme cold warrior. He regarded Jadid of Syria, the move that he made on, in support of the Palestinian, as entirely Soviet orchestrated. In other words, he thought that he, Jadid was doing this not because he was an Arab nationalist who, wanted, who believed in the Palestinian cause, but he regarded Jadid as nothing other than a puppet of the Soviet Union, and he was receiving orders from the Soviet Union. So the incidents relating to sending of tanks to Jordan, the Syrian tanks to Jordan uh, to support Palestinian was viewed by Kissinger as entirely and completely orchestrated by the Cold War enemy of the United States, Soviet Union. Also, uh, what uh, helped Kissinger uh, believe that we could stand up to this Soviet aggression was that our ships were in the Mediterranean ready for confrontation. Indeed, we had a very impressive fleet there. At the same time, our Middle East ally Israel had planned to invade Jordan to help out King Hussein, just in case the Palestinians appear to have gotten the upper hand. So we have the Israelis ready to preempt and invade uh, to save King Hussein. Uh, we have Syrians trying to help Palestinians, and we have the Arab leader of Arab nationalism, Nasser, actually in support of uh, King Hussein. And since we viewed Soviet Union, uh, I'm sorry, since we viewed uh, Nasser as a puppet of Soviet Union, it never occurred to us uh, why would Nasser as a puppet would be supporting King Hussein, our allies, rather than the Palestinian. But when you're a cold warrior, you really don't worry about uh, falsifying evidence. You have your mind made up no matter what. So uh, you also may recall another complication here, and that is if you go back to the Syrian lecture, I mentioned that at this very moment, the commander of the Syrian Air Force is one, Hafez al-Assad, and he actually refuses to give air cover to the Syrian tanks that President Jadid had sent marching into Jordan to support the Palestinian. So you got the commander of the air force in Syria not providing air support to the tanks which were sent out by the Syrian president. So, uh, and also, as this is happening, there will be a coup in Syria with Jadid being deposed and Hafez al-Assad taking over. These items were things that I mentioned in the lecture on Syria. Now, as you can imagine, without the air cover, Jordan's small air force was more than capable of destroying the Syrian tanks. And in the process, uh, without the support of Syria, the Palestinian challenge was put down. So by taking on the Palestinians, Hussein's forces killed close to about 5,000 Palestinian in that, uh, during that Black September conflict. And thus, uh, King Hussein gained himself the reputation of killing more Palestinian than any other state, including Israel. In this context, there also was a Cold War lesson regarding the kind of confrontation that I just described for you, because the alliance pattern in the Middle East was pretty much a mirror reflection of the Cold War conflict that was going on between the United States and USSR in, that, in the Middle East theater. Now, if you're a Cold Warrior, you would see this episode as really a test of will 
on the part of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union uh, was testing our will and determination, and the Soviets were forced, because of our uh, display of will and determination, they were forced to back down, uh, and uh, therefore we managed to prevail in that confrontation. This is something a cold warrior such as Kissinger would reconstruct. Uh, the point that I really want to make is that had the Soviet Union been as deeply interested in the region as the U.S. was, this episode could very well have triggered World War III because to back his will and determination, you may recall I mentioned earlier, uh, Kissinger and Nixon put the United States on a nuclear alert. So this was a very dangerous moment uh, in our history. So after uh, the Palestinian defeat in the, hand of, uh, in the hand of King Hussein, the Palestinian really had to resettle their infrastructure in Lebanon. Remember, I started out pointing out that Jordan was a logical place. Now the Palestinian are getting kicked out of Jordan, so they have to resettle their infrastructure, and that brings me back to my main topic, Lebanon. This is where they end up resettling. Now, it was not as if the Palestinian all of a sudden came to Lebanon. They were really already there in some significant number. However, the big change was this. After September 1970, the Palestinian brought with them the infrastructure from Jordan to Lebanon. In other words, they transported their infrastructure uh, to Lebanon, and that change really had a profound impact on Lebanon. So first, the Palestinians were uh, mostly, there are a lot of Christian among them, but remember, they're mostly Sunni Muslim. Uh, some of them, of course, are uh, Orthodox Christian. With the bringing, in, with the move to Lebanon, you will see that it shifted uh, the balance, the sectarian balance, away from Maronites uh, toward the Sunnis. And second, Palestinian leadership is a modern one, and that meant that it was shifting away from the traditional forces to the more progressive and modern pro-change forces. So there was that kind of a shift. So if you look at the overall impact on Lebanon, it shifted the balance uh, toward the Muslim and toward the pro-change elements. Now remember that for Palestinian, the number one target is really the United States. Israel is for the most part regarded as the United States outpost in the Middle East. They really don't sharply distinguish between the two. Uh, so they had to remind us, the United States, what terrible things uh, we were doing to them in the Middle East and in Palestine. So as soon as they shifted or moved their infrastructure to Lebanon, they began the raids into Israel. Israel, for its part, reciprocated more than in kind, relying on the strategy of collective punishment. In other words, Israelis started to bomb Lebanon, and these bombing uh, raids resulted in others besides Palestinian uh, suffering damages and also getting killed. Maronite, who absolutely did not believe in the Palestinian cause from the start, were now getting hurt by the Israel's violent retributions. So they put a lot of pressure on the government of Lebanon to compel the Palestinian to stop the raids. Uh, but the Palestinian, uh, for their part, uh, this was their raison d'etre. They had to uh, fight for their land. So the process of Palestinian raids and retributions, uh, violent retributions by Israel, became a vicious cycle. Each cycle got more violent 
and more difficult to contain. Also, other things are happening in the meantime. In the southern Lebanon, where the Israelis mostly bombed in rat retaliation for the Palestinian raids into Israel, uh, the population was mostly Shiites. And like anyone else, the Shiites felt uh, that they're getting hurt for someone else's cause. The Shiite in southern Lebanon really began to hate the Palestinians because of all the problems they were causing. But at the same time, the Shiites and the Druze, two of the most, two of the important uh, sect in Lebanon, if you recall from previous lectures, they were the least politically participant, but uh, in due time they are becoming much more participant and much more aware. So we're getting very strong identities developing on the part of first uh, the Druze uh, and secondly the Shiites. Uh, the Shiites uh, are uh, under the leadership of a very charismatic leader by the name of Musa Sadr, who is eventually killed. Uh, a lot of people believe that uh, Gaddafi of Libya killed him. Uh, so Musa Sadr is their religious and spiritual leader, and they create the movement, Amal movement, which uh, they are leading. So this movement really laid down the cornerstone of Shiite political identity. And this really means that the Shiite will become far more assertive than they had been, and so would the Druze. Also recall that the Maronite already had pretty well developed identity. And so you have this situation in Lebanon being a prime example of a non-nation state in which you have conflicting identities. Many Lebanese feel that there is a dilemma between their sectarian identity versus their ethnic identity as Arabs. So that is also a source of conflict, this identity confusion, identity challenge. So to sum up, uh, in 1970 to 1975, we are witnessing a period in which Lebanon is crawling toward a civil war that is going to break out in 1975. So the prosperity is still going on, but there are very troubling signs down there that indicates that good things are soon will come to an end.